Japanese architect uh, living in New York. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, interconnectivity of architecture, which is often shaped by uh, economy and emotion. Um, I want to first start from my own uh, life uh, in relation to a global economy. Uh, this is Japanese GDP graph, as you might uh, recognize. Um, <laughs> so after the war, we had a very steady growth of modernization of 9% growth. Uh, but after uh, 73, the first um, um, uh, oil crisis, uh, it went down and it had a steady uh, decline, like a giant steps. And it's all marked by like three um, major economic um, crises. This is my life superimposed to the economy. Um, Basically, I was born right after, or the same year as the crisis. I attended university after the bubble burst, and I became a partner of the architectural uh, uh, firm uh, after the um, crisis. Um, so, I'm doomed to live with a downturn. Uh, this is, I'm the first, uh, second generation uh, gen uh, in Japan. My parents are, um, the first generation, obviously. Um, if you really overlay this, uh, of course, there is no meaning, but I always wonder, <laughs> I always wonder this means, because they, this must be uh, representing something. <laughs> so I was always interested in the potential of the uh, recession. Um, so I, had, uh, I conducted the research studio at Harvard, uh, investigating how architecture and urbanism react to the uh, times of downturns. Uh, in short, um, this is the uh, economics uh, index, but somehow in, in reverse, uh, inverse, there's an inverse reaction to the feeling and uh, planning and connecting and thinking. So there's a, a kind of a totally different direction of uh, thinking. <laughs> and for example, there is a new architecture and uh, architectural and programmatic typology arose during the recession. Uh, it's called megachurch. Um, this is the megachurch is a kind of uh, enormous uh, spectacle based uh, church which is attached to a huge parking and a mall. Uh, so basically, you can, uh, you can combine consuming and praying. Um, but it's, it's also true in the history that uh, inventions, uh, many inventions were made during the recessions, such as jet engine, a space a race, uh, internet, uh, iPod, you name it. And also true in architectural history, a lot of manifestos, uh, of architecture and urbanism were uh, written during the downturn. Basically, when architects don't have enough work, uh, they, they can stay and write good books. Um, I've been observing the relationship of uh, the architectural expression and also uh, the economy. Uh, this is designed in 60s in Japan, a uh, group called Metabolist. Uh, as you can see, there's an incredible sense of gravity and also uh, optimism. Uh, this is some of them uh, realized. As you can see, it's, uh, it has a complexity, a multiplicity, materiality. And above all, what is important is that it was a, a projection of a vision in Japan at the time. Uh, after 35 years of recession, this is one of the mainstream architecture in Japan which has no sense of gravity, no edge, no corners, um, uh, no materiality, and uh, it's very white, <laughs> basically. Um, this is a product uh, line, uh, a brand called Muji. Actually, it's in, in this building, um, which has been very successful even uh, despite of the downturn of Japan, uh, even outside Japan supposedly uh, showing the uh, minimalist culture of Japan. Uh, but for me, uh, this is a kind of disturbing um, uh, recognition because it took away the brand maybe successfully, but for me, it took away uh, to the point, it took away a little too much to the point that it became 
energyless and characterless. Um, this is the ultimate product by Muji. Uh, <laughs> it's a Rubik's cube. It's a Rubik's cube uh, in six shades of gray. So for me, this is like the the representation of the the recession that becomes almost a pointless exercise. Um, so with that background, I've been always interested in experiencing uh, modernization like my uh, parents did. Um, so I, of course, moved from one country to the other. First went to Holland and then uh, worked in New York, in China, and back, uh, back to New York now. Um, and somehow, one, you know, bridging between these, uh, these, these are all GDPs. Uh, gaps, and I call myself economical refugee because I'm basically chasing wherever uh, it makes sense to be as an architect. Uh, when I entered a firm called OMA, which, which uh, I'm a partner of, uh, during the mid-90s we had a lot of American projects, but after 911 there was a, a shift in dynamics. Uh, so right after 911, we were invited to uh, design uh, headquarters for a new uh, central television uh, in China, in Beijing. Uh, when I first went to China, uh, I felt the energy that I never felt in Japan. This is one really tiny example. Uh, this is a market in China. As you can see, it has an incredible sense of multiplicity. Uh, multiple style, multiple texture, multiple seasons, uh, and also uh, the sheer density that uh, embeds the salesperson and the mannequins <laughs> into the shop. So I'm not laughing about it. I was so uh, shocked and uh, glad that I was in a, finally experiencing something different. Uh, this is the current state now of uh, CCTV, which we luckily won, and now it's built. Um, it's, it, I can't, of course, I'm not going to deny the fact that I carried on the energy that I felt in China when I designed this building. Um, but the iconic nature is often talked about in, in this project, but the, the, the process was actually very um, rational. So all these, um, it was very clear from the brief, competition brief, that uh, the client wanted to have uh, different buildings for different departments uh, of uh, television making. But we thought it was uh, such a beautiful idea to connect all the department into one single shape, a loop we call, and symbolically represent the uh, never ending and never uh, uh, ending um, TV making. Uh, this is how complex the building is. So there's a studio, a new studio, a broadcasting machine. Uh, there's a penthouse of executives, etc. But what we are really happy about is that we, the fact that we have a public route throughout the building where you can pay and visit and have a very strong engagement to the uh, TV making. Uh, so you can enter here, uh, peek into the studio, go up this tower, uh, view the entire Beijing, uh, and come back to the same pro uh, point from the other tower. Um, the sh one, th one another thing that we are happy about is the shape. Um, of course, it's very expressive, but now that it's built, we are very uh, happy how it reacts to a different moment in the city. Uh, sometimes it's very expressive, or as mysterious, or very urban, uh, almost intimate. Uh, yeah, like an intimate, almost like a good neighbor. <laughs> uh, and it's surprising that with such an iconic structure, it could be a perfect background to the daily life of Beijing. And at some point, it's, it's, it's been there for a while, so you, you really feel like with the Beijing's uh, typical gray climate, uh, it feels like it's there for, uh, for a while. Uh, this was when, right before the Christmas, uh, not the Christmas, sorry, the Olympic. Uh, 
uh, well, right before Christmas. Um, Olympic, when Nike projected their uh, campaign in, onto the building. Um, so, although we kind of omit America and started to work in China, it was uh, acknowledged by America in the end too. Uh, another post-911 uh, project, it's in Jersey City. Um, uh, ironically, Jersey City's uh, renaissance came after 911 when financial business moved across Hudson. Um, the site was here where, uh, in between the coast where it was developed after 911 and the existing city. And the program mix was a typical one, like a condominium, hotel, uh, artist loft, retail, parking. Uh, developer came with this sketch first. Uh, we politely said no for the sake of uh, Jersey City's future. <laughs> but we realized how uh, rigid uh, the formula of developers were. Um, so we investigated uh, heavily about the formulas and committed ourselves to design something out of, uh, rather out of the tight constraints. Uh, so what we did simply is to identify an ideal layout and volume for each program uh, out of the for developer's formula and stack them on top of each other like a wooden block. So basically this is the, it's showing maybe the best of our intention that all these boxes can be uh, anonymous and perfect, uh, but it creates uh, a public space throughout the building. Um, so it looks, it uses the dimension that is established by the developers, so it could stand out, uh, of, obviously, with the shape, but it could also blend in uh, to the existing uh, repertoire of Jersey City. Uh, developer was very happy because, of course, it's super iconic, so it increases the value, but inside each box, is, it's almost a perfect layout. Um, the skyline, skyline, effect on the skyline is quite uh, if dramatic. Uh, this is from uh, Manhattan. Uh, the last project I want to show is uh, a condominium on 22nd Street between Park and uh, uh, Broadway in front of Madison Square Park. Uh, when we got the commission, this building called uh, One Madison Park was already built. Uh, then we were supposed to make a smaller building that shares the amenity base, so almost like an unequal twins. <laughs> at the time, at the height of uh, economical boom in New York, uh, all the architects and developers were fighting or competing against uh, each other, mobilizing every possible elements and features of a, uh, an architecture, so a shape, facade, even historical reference. Um, but when, well, since the site was very close to uh, this building, a flat iron, we decided to learn from this, uh, which is how uh, effortlessly being iconic uh, by extruding the site, basically, a triangular site. Um, so we were uh, committed to now uh, find the specificity of the project that we wanted to use for the design. And we found immediately because the whole premise of the project was already uh, so specific. So basically, uh, the developer already sold the units or pre-sold the units of one Madison Tower. So he, they didn't want us to go higher than 250 feet. But the area that they could have built was much more. So you can see the, in blue, it's already going past 250 feet. Um, so we decided to be very, very obedient. Uh, so after 250 feet, we started to uh, gradually sway away from uh, the tower. And also stepping out this words, preserving a light penetration to the terraces uh, nearby. Uh, somehow that resulted uh, resembling the New York typology that is often generated by zoning law, uh, but also mirrored at the bottom. So because of that uh, form, sometimes it has a very different view from different angle. Um, this one, it looks like a typical New York uh, building. 
This one, it looks like a shy child uh, behind its old sibling. This one, it looks almost straight. And uh, in some views, of course, it shows its entirety. Uh, this is a view from 22nd Street. And this is a view from 23rd Street, which uh, looks like it's emerging from nowhere. Uh, we also wanted to explore the pot potential to have uh, a, a variety within the building. So we introduced uh, something very untypical in condominium, which is a sectional diversity, which is in re related to the structural need. Basically, in the center where it's dark, you need more, uh, uh, th there's higher forces, so you have to have more wall space. So in the center where the uh, plan is quite expansive, because of the structural constraint, it, it created punched out windows, so it becomes like a panoramic um, unit. And when it's liberated from the structure, it becomes uh, quite open, and also it becomes taller in height uh, and become a loft-like space. So that was our idea to provide different experience throughout the building. Um, when we designed the building, we thought that it resembles not only to the uh, New York vernacular step building, but also upturn. But of course, <laughs> if you look at it from the other side, it implies the downturn. And unfortunately, the, the latter became true, and it's, the project is indefinitely on hold. But we are looking for new investors, if there is one here. <laughs> I will be around. Um, and, sorry, it's, it's ironic that uh, two most obedient buildings that I showed later haven't realized, uh, but somehow CCTV, which is 5.5 uh, million square feet, got realized. And I think that it shows me something about the interconnectivity of what I uh, described earlier, uh, economy, emotion, etc., and the specificity. Um, I would like to end with uh, a one observation that I have also in relation to the economy uh, that I think it's putting our way of designing in danger, which is to be very super specific to the givens. Uh, this is city of Tokyo. Uh, it's about one point, uh, 13 million inhabitants. Uh, it's big enough to have uh, different characters in different areas of the city and also a diverse character throughout the city. Uh, metaphorically, it's compared to uh, a la carte family style dinner, which has uh, diverse dishes and diverse ingredients. Uh, but lately, it's also true in uh, New York, uh, there are a lot of uh, huge commercial development that has almost the same ingredients. So these are the two major uh, new uh, developer-driven uh, commercial buildings that are, uh, that are finished in Tokyo that has almost the same ingredients, um, which we think it's almost like a bento box that uh, all the ingredients are, are packaged into one strict container. So what used to be very diverse and fun and connected and stimulating uh, di a dinner table uh, becomes almost like a boring and individual and packaged uh, dinner. <laughs> so the city start to become like a, a slightly different version of, uh, uh, it has a different you know, skin and form and everything, but the inside, the program is more or less the same. So this is the danger that the, the city, the experience of the city is becoming very seamless, but also very monotone. And I think that's not only uh, in Tokyo, but it's also uh, true uh, as I'm working globally uh, in every other um, area of the earth. So I, I, I want to end with this image that uh, as an architect which uh, I really want to avoid living. Thank you. <laughs>